there's a great deal of thinking that needs to take place in Christianity about how this is applied in the life of believers and in the world. Because even if there is a sense in which this is not a physical description, we still have bodies. We still relate to people. We still live in cities. We still have marriages. We still go to places where we worship God specifically or for a particular act on a Sunday. So how does that apply without thinking that really it's just churchianity, churchianity, not Christianity, right? It's not all about being in the church building on a Sunday. It applies everywhere. So how do those things work out? Well, well, Herbert's poetry to some degree is meditating on that. And I'll look at some of the poems. I'd like to look at more of them, but we don't have time for all of them, and I wouldn't do them any service if I rushed through too many. But I'm going to look at one. These will be, this is a, a so-called shape poem. It's called Easter Wings. Now, uh, the image in, in mind here, I will, I'll read it to you, but I'll, I can, I wonder if I can blow that up one more. No, I can't, not without losing the whole of the picture. Uh, Easter wings, where are they in the building? A church building, they're nowhere to be found. Like there are no Easter winks. Like you know what Easter is. Easter is the day of the resurrection. It's when Jesus rises from the grave. That's Easter. Well, where are the wings? There aren't any. However, if you look at, uh, if, you're, if you have a biblical knowledge, uh, which not so many do these days, uh, the uh, cover of the Ark of the Covenant, the atonement cover, the uh, has wings of the cherubim and they almost touch and that place where the wings almost touch is called the mercy seat and Easter is connected with the mercy of God so I think he has those things in mind here he has a visual image in mind but it's got more it's got far deeper significance than a description of a physical object which of which there are none in churches anyway there aren't depictions of an you know the Ark of the Covenant but we know what the Ark of the Covenant must have looked like just simply from the exhaustive descriptions in scripture. Now God was, re was said to dwell within that space. Well, there's almost no space there. So it's not a physical dwelling. It's a, it's a, there's a spiritual significance. He's, he's at that place where the angels worship. And where we do, it's the holy of holies and so forth. So all of that is in mind when he writes Easter wings, he has that in mind. Now look at the shape of the poem. It goes in and out, so it's a bit like twice, right? And so if you think of these, you flip it around, it's like wings. And it goes to a narrow point, and then it spreads back out. So let's read the poem, and then we'll comment on the theology of it here. So stand over here. Lord, who created man in wealth and store, Though foolishly he lost the same, decaying more and more, till he became most poor. With thee, O oh, let me rise as larks harmoniously, and sing this day thy victories. Then shall the fall further the flight in me. My tender age in sorrow did begin, and still with sickness and shame, Thou didst so punish sin that I became most thin. With thee let me combine and feel this day thy victory. For if I imp my wing on thine, affliction shall advance the flight in me. So let me comment on this first of all. First of all, we have two stanzas that are exactly the same in their shape. And so in addition to and, and of course, the, but they are two. So there is a unity within each individual stanza, right? And there's a coherence to it. On the other hand, we ought to, in some ways, compare this one to that one. It's, it's intentional. There's an explicit um, parallelism, and parallelism invites a comparison, right? It's not just that there are two. If they were two and they didn't have the same shape, you might think that there was a linear progression there was a sort of a pause. So think about uh, George Herbert or uh, Dunn's The Flea. There were three stanzas. And as the three progressed, there was a sort of a progression from where he began to where he ended. And he actually ended where he began to some degree. But, but there wasn't any parallelism per se. 
whereas here there clearly is. And there's a lot of commonality. What's the commonality? Well, here he's most poor, and then he begins the expansion again with thee. Here he's most thin, and he begins again with thee. So those are obvious, direct parallels, repetition of language. And in fact, here it's exact, with thee. And in both cases, there's a sense of, um, well, metrically. So he begins, Lord who created man in wealth and store. It's pentameter, and then it goes to uh, tet uh, tetrameter and trimeter and dimeter and monometer. So it goes from five uh, five feet, five um, iams, to four iams, to three, to two, to one, and then goes from one to two, three to four to five. So it, it, it it's like a wing. If you think of a wing, when a bird flaps its wings, it comes to its side and then, and then it goes back out again. Right? So the bird uh, it seems rather like it doesn't have wings when it's brought the wings to its side and then it, they expand back out. So its, its wings are to some degree clipped by its own flying. Well, the first um, stanza I would submit is speaking about man well, first of all, it's about creation and it's about man. So it's the original state of mankind. Referring to Adam. When he's referring to man, referring to man as the generic category of w in which all are included. Not referring to a man as opposed to a woman, but all of mankind. The language that's used in Genesis. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So it's the inclusive male and female that's in mind here. And man, it said he lost. And again, it's not just the men that lost it, but he, again, as taking man as an individual representing the species, grammatically speaking. So you created man in wealth and store, though foolishly he lost the same, so the fall. Decaying more and more, so the consequences of sin, the reduction of the fullness with which God created us, he created us in a blessed state. We lost that through sin. And as a consequence, entropy sets in. This is the modern biological term for it. Entropy, disease, decay, death. Uh, you're, you're, and, and actually, modern genetics will talk about uh, when, we, uh, when people procreate, the uh, species isn't getting better, it's getting worse despite the, the theory of progress, at a biological level, there are copying mistakes. And so people are actually more sick than they used to be, not more healthy. The, the modern science, modern medicine may be more advanced, but the human condition is actually deteriorating. People might live longer. Well, that's because they have a healthier diet. They have less wars, etc. These, th this, these may be, but physically, not so. Lots of copying mistakes, and that can be enhanced through various other things. So if you want to, if you commit incest, there's all manner of copying mistakes. It actually helps to uh, marry somebody who is very different from you in terms of avoiding the copying mistakes, but never mind, totally off topic. But that's what he's talking about, the decay. It's not just there's an initial fall, there's a decay, a, 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 a decline, till he became most poor. So he was at first wealthy and now he's poor. And now he means this on a physical level, of course, but he means more than that, far more than that, spiritually is what he really means. There's a poverty which is connected with his own assessment, his being man's assessment, that he's, he's doing really well. So his pride is a symptom of his poverty because his pride makes him think that he's like a god and will not be judged. And that is not only foolish, it's a, it's a sign of, a, of utmost decay, as if he could live forever. And at the, so that's how man began. And then there's a reference to he, so man, he, he. The objective, referring to the human race. But Herbert, in response to that, then personalizes it. With thee, oh, let me rise, because he includes himself in mankind. He's not, it's not them and 
us, we're different. I'm one of those who, who is in that same state, prone to pride, prone to decay, prone to spiritual destruction. But with thee, O oh, let me rise, as larks harmoniously. Now a lark, a skylark flies up, makes a beautiful song. It's a songbird, beautiful song. And it, it, it flies, it's in England, right? Yes? Aren't they like, uh, like my grandmother used to tell me to stop skylarking. <laughs> They're not a pest, no, but I mean, you might have thought that because your grandmother's telling you off, right? So you're a pest, therefore a skylark's a pest. They, they hover above the ground. They bat, uh, flap their wings quite uh, quickly and they, they hover. It's really interesting. And they did, you know, flitting about and so forth, like, you know, fast wings. So, you know, stop being so, yeah, I guess. I've never heard skylarking. Larking about, I've heard. Yeah. And then, uh, I I heard another happy as a lark. Happy as a lark. And that's a reference to the uh, beautiful song. It's a songbird. But he, oh, let me rise as larks harmoniously. Now, the harmony here, harmony is not just music. It's a music that is, um, fits the way things actually were meant to be. And this is the understanding I said last time in, the, in my discussion of the seven liberal, liberal arts. Mathematics and music are very closely linked. The reason mathematics works is because there's an orderly universe and God has created it that way so mathematics can understand it very precisely in fact. And music is the, um, the aural uh, perception of that mathematically precise universe that God's created and people hear it. So it's not just that there's an order, there is a fittingness, it seems appropriate, it's right. And that harmony is not perceived through pride, it's through humility, receiving it as God's created order and accepting that. But as that, and rise as larks harmoniously and sing this day thy victories. Okay, so now he's singing about the victory that's connected with his recognition of his own poverty and also with somebody else's rising. So it's Easter. This is a, this, this first poem, and then shall the fall further the flight in me, if I am with you or with thee, then I shall rise. I can't rise on my own. I can rise with you. Reference to the whole of the Easter event, but in particular, uh, Good Friday, the death, and then up from the grave he rose. So what I would say it refers to justification. A confession that Christ's blood atoned for our sins. He bore the wrath of God so that God was satisfied and that men and women might uh, be able to rise from the body of sin that committed them to death because it says in scripture that we're dead in our sins. So what can a dead man do to rise to save himself? Uh, nothing. Jesus doesn't say you're sick in your sins. He says you're dead. So that's how poor he is. He's, He's dead. That's pretty stark decay. Okay. That's how he begins it. So he's reflecting on mankind in general in these first uh, six lines. One, two, three, four, five, wrong, five lines. And in the second five, he is contemplating on how he can rise from that and he can't do it on his own. He can do it with him, with Christ, with thee. Oh, let me rise. The second, on the other hand, is more of a personal reflection. So this is mankind in general. Well, now he is with Christ, that he has been justified by faith, by faith that Christ died for him and rose for him and he is with him. If he believes in him, he rises with him. It's not by his own works, it's by Christ's work. Okay, 
But my tender age, now it's more personal. This was a, about mankind in general. This is now about Mr. Herbert himself. My tender age in sorrow did begin. Now he's talking about suffering as a Christian. Just because you've been saved by God doesn't mean you're not going to suffer any problems or suffer any hardships or suffer persecution. Paul talks exactly about that. And this is what distinguishes the Christian faith from uh, other intellectual traditions is that the Christian regards uh, suffering as the, something that God himself controls and in fact uses for the purposes of blessing. It's a, it's a tool which nobody likes. <laughs> Don't bring out the suffering tool. That's, I would rather use the different tool. Can you use the comforting tool? I like that, that tool. That one's I like to be comfortable. Well, uh, God comforts us in our suffering and afflicts us. And this is what he's talking about. My tender age in sorrow did begin and still with sicknesses and shame thou did so punish sin that I became most thin. Who's the I? Remember I said last time that to be a Christian is to be a sinner, but also to be a forgiven sinner. Forgiven sinners don't have their own nature. They have a new nature. It's God's given nature. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. That it's a, a genuinely new nature. But there's an old man that keeps kicking around and keeps on sinning. So there's like, it's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I mean, we're going to read that next semester in my class. Literally, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There's one guy that's like this, and then there's another guy that it seems totally opposed to it. How is that? How can that be? It is so. It is so. And your job is to put Mr. Hyde to death. He's already dead. He was, he was died for by Christ, but you've got to keep on putting him to death. Keep on repenting. Don't feed Mr. Hyde. <laughs> Give Dr. Jekyll his time. Let him flourish. And to do that, you have to make sure Mr. Hyde doesn't feed on what makes him flourish. At any rate, but he becomes, and he is so punished sin that I, the I, the old man, and to some extent the new man, becomes most poor. Because, of course, if Christ suffered, it wasn't just in, his, in, in the dereliction at the cross, it was in the abandonment of his friends. It was in the scourging that he experienced. It was in the loneliness and the abandonment and so forth. These things that were true of him will also be true of us. If they persecuted me, says Jesus, they'll also persecute you. If you're my people, if you are part of who I am, right? If you're in Christ, to use Paul's words, then of course you are also going to suffer. And the suffering is not a sign that God's abandoned you. It's because it's a sign that you are his. So that's what he's talking So I became most thin. Now with thee, let me combine and feel this day thy victory. So here is an acknowledgement of the victory intellectually, but let me feel it as well as know it. For if I imp my wing, now to imp is to uh, like to uh, dovetail is the word that uh, Coleridge comes up. So I don't know if you've ever seen the birds' feathers. They 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 are not just in the line. They overlap a bit. So there's no there's no gaps. There's no air that gets through it. They're magnificent creation actually. The wings they're super light and at the same time they're airtight. To imp is to put things together. So imp my so. And feel this day that victory. For if I imp my wing on thine. So Christ's Easter wings. What allowed him to rise from the dead? Well, he didn't have any wings. Christ didn't rise from the grave with wings on. It's the sense of what is that allows him to rise from the dead. It was the wings of the power of God. God doesn't have any wings. He has life. Death cannot hold him. The grave can't hold him. Then, if I imp my wink on thine, affliction shall advance the flight in me. If, if, if I am in Christ, if I'm with Christ, if I'm not depending on my own wings, which I don't have, 
But if you, my own devices, if it, I am holding on to Christ who is in me, the hope of glory, that is what allows uh, uh, God to work in me. And affliction is not going to impede that, is going to advance it. So it's, it's called Easter wings. It's a terrific theological reflection in the poetic form. I actually think that the poetic form uh, is very powerful. When you talk about Christian theology, it sounds very abstract. I can talk about justification and sanctification, all of which is good, sound Christian doctrine ne necessary. It's helpful to have a visual image as well. God uses visual images throughout scripture. How come? Why doesn't he just give us systematic theology? I think there's a good reason for it. I'm proposing what I think the reason is. People are visual learners, I'm told. That doesn't mean that they want to see visual images. I don't need to use PowerPoints. All my points are PowerPoints without, power, <laughs> without using PowerPoint. If you use this power of God, the Spirit of God, that's a powerful point. And you, you, you can use words to give a visual image. You don't have to, use a, you don't have to draw a picture. But here he has done that, and it's to some degree helpful. But you have a sense of that now. He's using the visual images that God himself uses in Scripture. Right? Okay, so that's the first uh, poem. What do you think of it? You like it? I think it's magnificent myself. So that's the first one I asked you to read. Uh, the second one, I think this is the second one. This is prayer. Now, this is a very different poem. And uh, it's not like the other one. It's, I mean, what would the shape of prayer be? I don't know. It, I guess he could have come up with a, uh, a form, but he hasn't done that. But he has written something that is in a form that we might already recognize. It's a sonnet. It's a 14-line poem. And it's a Shakespearean sonnet at that. There are three quatrains, three bits of four, and then there's a rhyming couplet at the end. Now. Uh, as I say, sonnet is a form developed in the Renaissance, with usually with courtly love conventions. So it's a man writing to a woman, to, and, and it's an adoration. It's a form of adoration, these poems. That's the early beginnings of a sonnet. Sonnets are used by poets ever after that, and they never get away from the early inception. They, they can't. The form has certain strong associations. Now. When you know that you have those in your audience, your audience will be expecting certain things. Now you can work with that. This is what God himself does in scripture. He creates certain images and he does it historically. It takes a very long time to get a sense of what the people of God means, what the temple means, what marriage means, what uh, holiness means. There's a holiness code around the temple and so forth. All of those things, he creates a very fixed, strong image and with that, then, he can work with it. And that's what, what effectively the literary tradition does. Uh, what we talked about the epic. There are certain conventions that are established, which once they're there and you know what they are, then later poets can use those and, and can enhance them. And in some ways, we're going to see next semester when we start with John Milton uh, and his Paradise Lost, he's going to overturn the epic and he's going to change the definition of heroism entirely because Christ will be the hero, right? The, the true man, that will be the new model of heroism. Not like Achilles, not like Odysseus, not like Aeneas. Although all of those characters have something that we can play on and utilize, but not we, it has to be born again, the poetry. But it's gonna use the old body in order to manifest what is true about the new body. You see how it fits, and it does fit. So here we have prayer. Now, it's a, I said it was a sonnet, so a Petrarchan love song, but it's about prayer. Is that really a love song? It's a funny old poem. I'll, I'll read it to you. And then uh, what you're going to find is there's a, it's just a list. It's a list of associations with prayer. And the, there's a randomness, apparent randomness to them as well. I mean, there's some things that seem to, it's following along and the, you know, I say, oh, that relates to that and re that relates to that. And then, oh, where did that come from? Some of them are good associations of prayer. Some are uh, biblical. Some of them are misuses of prayer. What does Herbert say? Prayer, one, by the way, that he writes more than one poem about prayer. 
marks of the Christian life, by the way, prayer. Prayer, the church's banquet, angel's age, God's breath in man returning to his birth, the soul in paraphrase, heart in pilgrimage, the Christian plummet sounding heaven and earth, a plummet you drop the stone down to see how deep the waters are. Engine against the Almighty. Engine here, he is thinking like of a, uh, a cannon, recoils on itself. Engine against the Almighty. Sinner's tower, reversed thunder, Christ's side piercing spear. The six days world transposing in an hour. A kind of tune which all things hear and fear. Softness and peace and joy and love and bliss, exalted man, a gladness of the best, heaven in ordinary, man well dressed, the Milky Way, the bird of paradise. Church bells beyond the stars heard, the soul's blood, the land of spices, something understood. Now these are apparently random associations and there, there is not a continuity. It, it goes from things that are decidedly uh, obvious associations with prayer and things that are going to be positive statements about prayer to misuses of prayer, which are also an aspect of prayer. Who has not prayed? Words, uh, again, you're praying and you're speaking to God and the prayers are actually attacks on God. I'm angry. Do people not express angry prayers? Are these not assaults on God's goodness and character? Does David not pray, pray such prayers? I, is, is the Bible endorsing the attacks on God? No, it's illustrating that, that people use prayer this way. This is not to say it's right. It's to say that people do do it and you've heard them and you've heard them because they come out of your own mouth. Not all prayer is actually prayer. It's not the right purpose of prayer. On the other hand, prayer is God's gift of speaking to God. He allows you the uh, latitude and the freedom to misuse your gift. Doesn't mean he's gonna answer it <laughs> uh, and give you what you're after, uh, which is uh, a consequence of his grace. People don't get what they ask for sometimes, and that's a good thing. And sometimes they get way more than they ask for. And that's also a good thing. Actually, it's always a good thing. If affliction is also part of God's toolbox, then sometimes uh, prayer is going to give you something that you didn't want, didn't like, and yet it will also be for your good. If even the cross can be used by God for his purposes, where God's at his weakest, he can work his most almighty strength, then God can use all things for his glory. So here, but here it's the church's banquet. It's a big marriage feast. Think about the ending of scripture, Revelation. And this is prayer. This is what the saints do. They pray, they call out to God. Not just those who are the afflicted, but all the, and this is the banquet. This is the conversation. If you think about a, a good banquet, it's not just the food you're eating, although there is the food. It's the great conversation that goes with it. Wonderful. I don't know if you've ever been at a banquet like that. Hopefully the one that Tyndale has at the end of the year will be one like that. I rather doubt it, <laughs> that it will be that good, but hopefully it will be. You can imagine, but it's the church's banquet, the people of God. It's angel's age. That's a funny association because the angel has been praying, praising God forever. So he's, he's talking about something earthly and temporal and here's something that seems eternal, not that the angels are eternal, but something that seems to last longer than that. So it's giving us a bigger sense of what prayer is. Then he moves to God's breath in man returning to his birth. God gives the breath of life to Adam. The breath goes back to God. It's using it to praise his maker. The soul in paraphrase is to say the same thing in a smaller way. Your whole being is, brought, is wrought up in the act of prayer, but you can't represent your whole being. There's too much there. The human soul is actually a, an enormous thing. So it's in paraphrase. Heart in pilgrimage, 
the Christian plummet sounding heaven and earth at seeing how w w wide and deep and high and long is the love of Christ. That, so it's that, it's the plummet. It, how big is that? That is the Christian plummet, the, the prayer. But then he goes from that wonderful image to the exact opposite. It's a cannon shooting at God, engine against the Almighty. Sinner's tower. I'm praying God and I'm so humble. I want you to know how humble I am. I'm, I thank God that I'm not a sinner like those people. Who says that? The Pharisee, right? It absolutely is a reference to the Tower of Babel, the quintessential example of human power. In a city, Tower of Babel is right in the center of Babylon. It's the center, actually, it's in the land of Shinar, where, where uh, Daniel and his friends are schlepped to in exile. Do you know that? And they are taken to the land of Shinar, it says in Daniel, and that is where the Tower of Babel is. So now they are taken from a place where God uh, condescends to be amongst his people, and, he, and they're taken away to the place where historically the forces of God gathered in defiance of God. Let's see if we can build up a tower and see. And then God stoops down. This is in scriptures. Get, right. And then has to scatter their language to humiliate them, to prevent them from doing the wickedness that they would do if they were unified. At any rate, the sinner's tower, absolutely correct. Yep. Reversed thunder. So rather than the lightning and thunder coming down from God as it's depicted in Norse mythology and Greek mythology, Roman mythology, the other way around, we're th making thundering noises up at God. Christ's side piercing spear, so a prayer putting Christ to death again, because it's an expression of sin. And then he flips from that. But there's a whole, those, that one, two, three, four images, all devastating indictments of what prayer is actually used for. He's not endorsing it. The six days world transposing in an hour. Now, transposition is a, a musical term. Right? You transpose something into another key, whatever. So it's now all of that creation transposed into a single hour, an hour of prayer. It encompasses the whole of that. A kind of tune which all things hear and fear. There's a kind of tune that prayer latches hold of. There's a godliness. There's an awe. Don't ever underest underestimate how powerful goodness is. In the midst of a turbulent world, goodness is a powerful thing. Uh, as is innocence, which is why everyone's after it. In their wickedness, they're after innocence. And that's because there's a goodness there. And they think they can, in their sin, they think they can uh, capture it. He moves on from that. Softness and peace and joy and love and bliss, five things. So he just talked about a, a tune, he talked about a power, now he moves to almost the exact offices, opposite of that. Associations of quietness. Exalted manna, the food that God gave to the people in the wilderness. It, and this is a prayer. Prayer is a kind of food that sustains you. People take the, the sacraments, the Eucharist, the bread and wine, whatever you want to call it, and that's food, spiritual food, but so is prayer. It's a, it feeds your soul, sustains you. Gladness of the best, of the best they're glad for this. Heaven in ordinary, man well-dressed. Uh, Jesus talks, uh, or Paul talks about being clothed in the righteousness of Christ, being clothed. What is the clothing that Christ's people wear? Well, in Revelation, it talks about being white robes washed in the blood of the lamb. They're, and yet they're still white. So it's not a reference to the actual, it's, it's the metaphysical significance of the whiteness. It's the righteousness of Christ. So it's not a righteousness, righteousness of our own. It's Christ's righteousness that we're clothed in. So when God looks at me and you, he doesn't see us. He sees Christ. That's why we will gain entrance into the kingdom of God, because God will see 
himself when looking at us because we're in Christ's body and clothed in his righteousness. Remember when Adam and Eve uh, fell, they realized they were naked and they were ashamed suddenly. Well, they're naked before. Why was that not shameful before? It's, it's a symbol of their awareness of their lack of righteousness. They had it before. Now they don't have it. It's not a reflection on their nakedness. It's a reflection on their lack of righteousness. And so what does God do? We clothe them with animal skins. Something has had to be sacrificed there. It's the animal. They knit their own clothing. It's not very good, by the way. And then God gives them a better clothing, animal skins. Anyway. Man well dressed, the Milky Way, the bird of paradise, which Don would only have heard about from reports. He wouldn't have seen one. You've seen them if you watch uh, David Attenborough's uh, uh, nature shows. Have you ever seen them, the crazy things? You ever seen birds of paradise? Look it up on YouTube or something. That's the funniest thing. They do the strangest dance. They're beautiful, but the most hilarious things you'll ever see. The mating ritual of the male bird of paradise, of which there are uh, hundreds of varieties. He's now just ta talking about the exotic and the beautiful. So it's not just, it is the ordinary, and yet it's something that is so rare and so beautiful. Finally, and in the rhyming couplet, and this is with the, uh, what he closes it with, church bells beyond the stars heard. So the celestial music. I talked about that, right? The music of the sphere. So our earthly music is an, an analogy of the true music, which is in the presence of God, which is sung by the saints and the angels. The angels are singing God's praises. Do you hear them right now? They are being sung. Why can't you hear them? Because you're a fallen, sinful human being, but they are nonetheless singing. And when we sing, our singing is joining that throng. It's beyond the stars heard, the soul's blood. Now the soul is a, uh, is a sort of a microcosm of the whole person. And blood in scripture is also a metaphor of life. You know, when Cain slays Abel, God says that his blood cries out from the ground. It's his life. It's part for the whole. The land of spices, again, something exotic. And then the last one is the terrific English quality of understatement. So all of those things, and then the most mundane of them all, whatever it is, he's had to use a thousand descriptions, not quite a thousand, but all sorts of descriptions. It's something understood. By whom? Not by him, by God. So your prayers aren't very, uh, you're not a very good speaker. You don't pray well, or you don't speak very well. Do you not think God understands you better than you express it? I think so. Just like children come to their parents, they say things. Parents know what they're after. They say this, but they didn't mean that. You gonna start upbraiding them for logical fallacies in their language? Hopefully not when they're two. Maybe when they're in their teens, because it's necessary that they understand the laws of logic. But when they're three and four and five and whatever, the main thing is that they're understood, however badly they communicate. That's what prayer is. Anyway, I think it's, again, a magnificent poem. Very different from the other one. Both of them part of the temple. Easter wings, because Easter is at the center of the Christian life, the resurrection of Christ. Prayer is a part of the resurrected. It's a conversation with the living God, they being the living stones in the temple. Comments or questions? Okay, good or not good, but I have no time, so. This one is a very famous poem. There's Herbert there, how about that? Never mind the picture. Wearing the fashionable collars of the Puritans of divines of his day. Love three, by the way, the Puritans are a part of uh, a variety of, Puritanism is in the Anglican church, it's amongst the Baptists, it's amongst the Presbyterians, it's more of a uh, devotional wing rather than a belonging to a denomination per se. It persists centuries after that and there is no Puritan church per se. Uh, this is one's called Love 3. Now love of course is a central 
uh, aspect of Christian life. Uh, Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is, and he answers love. Two kinds of love, actually. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. So love clearly in that sense. It's a personal uh, act. It's also, however, if you think about it and think back to Easter, the place where God demonstrated his love for us was when he died for sinners. This is love, says John, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave himself as a propitiation for sin. That's the definition of love, and it's connected with the cross, and it's connected with God's death and resurrection. And now, that's so all of these features, there's God's commandment, there's Christ's sacrifice, and then finally, in the Last Supper, God, uh, Jesus says, eat and drink. And they have the meal together, and the Apostle Paul says, whenever uh, we eat and eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord until he comes. So these are all an aspect of love. And he is reflecting more on the latter, but the latter includes all of the others. So he commands us to eat. Eat and drink. It's a, and, the, and this is the, what are they? It's celebrating the body and blood of Christ. That's in communion. So this is love three. And now it starts off with a personification, love. As a person, bade me welcome. Love bade me welcome. Yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. You can imagine a man who's walked into a church, communions being celebrated, He's not referring to the priest who sees him. It's Christ who sees him and is bidding him. He's he may be working through the language of the minister, but it's actually Christ in the presence of the church speaking the words of Christ. And the minister there is simply a representative of that, speaking those words. Do you lack anything? Why have you drawn away? You came in and now you're drawing away now that you see the presence. And what does he say? A guest worthy to be here. Oh, no, it's all here. He senses his own unworthiness. That's what's going on in the first stanza. He comes in. He's bade welcome. And yet he withdraws because he recognizes that he does not deserve to be in Christ's presence, to sit at the same table. Remember, Christ feasted with sinners. We know that. The convicted individual, convicted of his or her sin, feels unworthy. That's good. It's because it's true. You are unworthy. That's the point. That's why the death had to happen. <laughs> A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be here. The guest who's worthy to be here. I, so there are two in dialogue here. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, uh, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand. And smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? So I can't look on you with these eyes. I made those eyes, is the response. Who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame So now he's referring to the cross. Okay, well then, let me do something for you. You did something for me, let me do something for you. My dear, then I will serve, he says in response to love. And then love says, you must sit down and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. Back and forth, he's being corrected. He is being served, and he is not serving God by being there. He is being served. There is an aspect of us that doesn't want to be served, because to be served would be to acknowledge a master, and God commands. So in the washing of the disciples' feet, 
Peter's not going to do it. Peter speaks on behalf of the disciples as he often is. I'm not going to wash your feet. If I'm going to wash your feet, I'm going to wash the whole of you. Because the feet are the most undignified, the dirtiest things. It's, the, it's for the worst servants to do. The most menial servants wash the feet. I'm, let, me do, let me wash the whole of you. It says, unless I wash your feet, you won't be part of me. I will do this and you will be served and I, I will be humiliated and you will accept my humility and you will accept my humiliation and you will accept my service. So it's the word of a, man, a master who's also a servant and he's revealing something about the character of God which is that of love. This is a powerful poem, uh, often recited in uh, Anglican circles because it's such so magnificent. I wish it were more widely read. Yes? That last line seems very Eucharistic. Of course it is. Like the whole poem. The whole poem is Eucharistic. That's why I said it's called love. Now you could take it to mean in general Christians are to be loving, of course, but this is Eucharistic. There's no doubt about it. It's talking about the sacrament of communion, whatever you want, whatever language you want to use. Eucharist is a biblical word. Again, terrific poem in the temple. Of course it's part of the temple. Part of the temple in the sense that it's part of the church? Yeah, more in the sense it's part of the church in the sense of the people of God. They're commanded to do two things. Uh, in Catholic theology, there are seven sacraments. In uh, Protestant theology, there are two. And the two are baptism and the Lord's Supper. That's it. The ones that Jesus himself commands and the church endorses. There are others, uh, says the Catholic Church. The Protestants uh, dispute that, that they are sacraments. They might be good practices, but they're not sacraments. A sacrament is something that is laid down uh, by God and commanded <coughs> to do. He doesn't say, but so when, and when he commands, if you think of command, you always think of a forceful, you're compelled to do it. You know, eat this food and stick it down your throat. It's an invitation. It's the invitation with the force of a commandment, however. You know, come. And there, there is, there, there's no saying no. You must do this. But it, it's, it's more gentle than that in terms of the invitation because it's a willing, a willing laying down of your own pride to receive what you could not do for yourself, namely nourish yourself. Because he's going to give you life. He is the Lord of life. Anyway, it's all Eucharistic, as you say. Uh, so the final poem is called Virtue. Let's see if I can blow that up a bit. Maybe I can. It's called Virtue. <coughs> now you remember back when we did Dunn. As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper their souls to go, well, some sad friends do say the breath goes now and some say no. First line, first uh, stanza of valediction forbidding mourning. This word virtue. Virtue is connected with moral character, right? I think everybody in the English language recognized to be virtuous is to have a certain moral character. It means more than that. It, it, it's connected to some de degree with a word that is inside of it, this word vir, which means a man. So to be virtuous to be, is to be manly. Okay. What's our definition of a man then? It's not the male of the species, although there is a certain type of male virtue and there's a certain female type of virtue, and both of them are manly in the generic sense. So being courageous is certainly seen as manly in every tradition at all times, that's seen, but that's more than that. It also has to do with being faithful. It has to do with being self-sacrificing. But in Christian ta the Christian understanding, it's all wrought up in the person of the one man, Jesus Christ. So to be virtuous after Christ is to see him as the model of the ideal heroic man. 
not Aeneas, not Achilles, not Odysseus, no one else but Christ. And that will define what virtue is then. Gracious, authoritative, courageous, compassionate. Are those things true of the Greek and Roman epic heroes? They're not. I mean, some of them are. Courageous, yes. But compassionate, merciful, gracious, laying down his life for his enemies? No way. But these are now definitions of virtue. So there's a redefinition of virtue that is going on in this period. And you, you see it in the backdrop of almost the darkness of the ancient world. And it is full of darkness. They take away life at a pin. They lay out their infants to die on the streets. When they don't want them, they expose them to the elements, just like Oedipus was exposed. His parents didn't want them, we'll leave them to die. Let the animals come and eat them up. There's a darkness there. And the darkness is like if you take a diamond and you say, if you go to a jeweler and they want to show you their diamonds, you know what they do? They have a black velvet backdrop which absorbs the light. And the light then, which they is a big bright light, it makes the diamond shine. So the ancient world is a backdrop of blackness against which we can see the light of Christ. And the manhood of the ancient heroes, I think, is in some ways a blackness against which we can see the backdrop of the glory of Christ. So that's what this is about. It's about virtue. It's called virtue. Sweet day. There's four stanzas, four lines. Sweet day, so cool, so calm, so bright. The bridal of the earth and sky. The dew shall weep thy fall tonight, for thou must die. Who's the thou? He's speaking to the day as a personification. The day is going to have to die, even though it's a bridal of the earth and sky, like a marriage. Sweet rose, sweet day, sweet rose, sweet spring. Sweet rose whose hue, angry and brave, bids the rash gazer wipe his eyes. So the rash gazer is the one that grabs the rose. Oh, how beautiful. Yeah, that was rash. You're going to be crying after you grab the rose. Thy root is ever in its grave, and thou must die. Sweet spring, full of sweet days and roses, a box where sweets compacted lie. That my music shows ye have your closes, and all must die. Only a sweet and virtuous soul, like seasoned timber, never gives. But though the whole world turn to coal, then chiefly lives. Uh, when uh, organic matter falls into the earth, it gets compressed and it becomes carbon. It gets carbonized. Put carbon under a lot of pressure, what do you get? A diamond. But also it's the means of organic life. So never mind the environmental movement, which doesn't seem to understand the purpose of carbon, a natural element that <laughs> gives fuel to uh, the world and uh, gives life to the green matter of the world. They, they need carbon dioxide, never mind. He's not talking about any of that. He's using natural metaphors, but note that everything tends to death. So the day must die, the rose must die, the spring must die, but so must the soul, but in the dying it will live. And only a soul has this eternal property. But he, there's, there's the repetition, so the fourfold repetition, and note that the lines vary in their length and it goes down to iambic uh, diameter here. There's just two, for thou must die, and thou must die, and all must die, then chiefly lives. You die and die and die and then lives. The contrast between death and life could not be starker. The whole world is living and it is expressing the glory of God, even the bridal of the earth and sky, and yet that will all die. And yet, in the midst of this death, there is something that will yet live. And all these things are beautiful. The day, the rose that is, has the, uh, you know, and isn't this a terrific image? So it's an image of beauty. What is a, a rose is a beautiful thing, often given uh, in, uh, to lovers, right? Valentine's Day, you give roses, symbol of the expression of your love. But roses have thorns. 
and the thorns and thistles that come as a consequence of the fall this is wrought up in his comparison there's something beautiful and yet <coughs> it's not something that we can grasp without any pain it's not an unmitigated good there is evil even in it and that's because thy root is ever in its grave the root of the beauty of this world is still a fallen world and it too will die all beauty will fade and die and that's because its root goes down there whereas our root is in Christ he's the foundation right that's the root how deep does the roots of Christ go as deep as deep can be that's the foundation of it whereas the sweet spring and I think about spring it comes after the time of death the winter sweet spring full of sweet days and roses so this third stanza includes the previous two so it's going up in intensity one's the common day one's the expression of a beautiful fragrant thing the third includes all three of the all two of those things sweet spring full of sweet days and roses a box where sweets compacted lie uh, in in British English sweets are candies chocolates give some sweets and now they're compacted in a box so you give box of chocolates for Christmas and so forth the sweetness why do you give chocolates at Christmas by the way it's a funny thing it's a funny convention we uh, Easter Christmas what's with the sweets Jesus didn't give sweets at Christmas <laughs> he didn't give sweets at Easter nobody gave sweets but it's a representation of something of delight it tastes sweet there's a sweetness in the midst of a season of bitterness there's right there's a bitterness to the season and yet there's also a joy to it anyway but this the sweet spring it's full of these a box where sweets compacted like compacted like the dirt and also like in this case the chocolate my music which is partly his words but it's also his harmony and it's the thing that he is attuned to the celestial music shows ye have your closes and all must die so my music says that there's an end to music if you have, perform a piece, a musical piece, there's an end to it, to our music. And we're thankful for that. However good it is, there's a beginning to the concert and then there's an end to it. The end punctuates that. Where, and, and all things that are good come to an end. All must die. Whereas, and only and uniquely, only a sweet and virtuous soul. Now he comes to the word that he's not yet used, virtue. The poem's called virtue, but he finally comes to the thing that is virtuous. It has vitality. It has the sense of humanity in it. It has the sense of goodness in it. Only a sweet and virtuous soul, like seasoned timber. What's seasoned timber? We're Canadian, so we should know something about timber. What's seasoned timber? What is it? I used to work in a lumber yard. Does nobody else do anything with wood here? Nothing? Timber's the wood. It's not just what you cry when the wood the, the, with the tree falls. You call it timber. It's what you cut out of it, so it's timber. Okay, what is seasoned timber? Have you ever tried to make anything out of non-seasoned timber? It's been like, uh, hardness. Yeah, what happens when it dries? It hardens. Yeah, it hardens, yeah, but not only that, it bends. You want the timber to be seasoned. If you've got wet wood, it's going to warp. It, it, when it bends, it, it twists. It twists like a hockey stick. If only it were like a hockey stick, because it twists as well as bends. So you want it to be seasoned, and then it was, it's not only harder, it won't warp, and it won't twist like sin. Like a soul twisted by sin, it won't do that. A soul like seasoned timber never gives. It doesn't give way either. It holds your weight. It will allow you to stand. It's not going to give way under your feet. But though the whole world turned to coal, everything will just be carbonized. When it dies, that it will chiefly live. In the death of the human being, we're transposed into the key of eternal life. Right? And this little life, this little symphony that we're having of our own lives that's a prelude to the great concert which in which the angels and all the people of God throughout all ages
participate. So that, all of those, it's called virtue. It's, a, it's a, again, a comprehensive poem. It's he, he's not talking about small things, he's talking about big things. He's using it with really easy language. They're not complicated words here. I explained a couple of them because they're a little bit, some of them a little bit um, unfamiliar to us, but these are not long words. These are short, powerful, biblical, visceral, earthy words, and they are effective, I think. But your thoughts? You've looked at four po poems now. Your comments? What do you think? You ever heard of Herbert before? Some. Not many. No, I hadn't when I came to university. Yes? You had one about, well, no, it's okay. Well, let's skip back to Wings and you can ask about Wings. Well, it's just the verse that came to mind, you know, that the sun will rise with healing in his name. Yes. And there's other references like those who dwell from Malachi. Psalm 91, those who dwell in the secret place will rest underneath the shadow of the Almighty. Right. Almighty. Under his pinions, there's all sorts of reference to Wings, the wings of God surrounding me, covering me like a, an eagle with yeah. its... It's an image. It is, but of course God's not a bird, <laughs> right? But it's, it creates an image in the, in the mindset of the, of the reader, and, and it, it would, they would certainly be thinking about, although they haven't seen it, they would be thinking about the mercy seat of God as well. Being covered in the midst of that, but you're protected there. I mean, uh, uh, you can't even see the baby birds because mom's on top of them, sitting on top, and they're warm and protected and the body of the mother is exposed, but the, the chicks are not, unless the mother dies. They're safe. So th those images, they're there. Yeah, they're, they're rife throughout scripture. But scripture uses those images. Why don't people use images anymore in their language? Because they don't. There's good reason to be wary of imagination, but there's also, uh, it, this is not a, a tool that we can hand over to those who oppose the Christian faith, because God himself warrants it in his own language, and the church has historically always done so. I find listening to people's sermons uh, excruciating, because it's so lacking in beautiful language. And it creates images of the truth that they're presenting. It's, it's, Jesus tells stories with strong imagery. Why didn't Jesus just tell us what he really meant? Rather <laughs> than telling us a parable or giving us a story, just tell us what you mean. Well, he did. That was how he did it. How come we don't do it? We did do it, actually. That's my final point. The stories, this is why I ended up doing English literature. I was interested in philosophy, I liked history. Um, I was not a Christian as an undergrad, but I was drawn towards the Christian faith intellectually. But I did literature because it seemed to combine a lot of those things all under one roof. And it spoke in a way that I thought uh, allowed me to read the Bible better as well. I found that it did. And throughout the ages, I think men uh, and women have been blessed by the Christian literary tradition, and I wish that they would um, reattach themselves to it, because it's a great blessing, like sweets compacted. Anyway, okay, I'll see you now. Any uh, comments, questions? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Um, are we giving our essays today? Never. Never? No, I will give you your essays, but not today. And, but I will give them back to you 